Hello, and welcome to the Spoonie Authors Podcast, a podcast where we explore a different disabled author's stories each week. I'm your host, Diana Gunn, and joining us today is Nathan Caro Frechette. Nathan Caro Frechette is a queer, transgender, sequential artist, publisher, and author. He is co-owner of Renaissance Press and creator of the ongoing online graphic novel, Some Assembly Required. Hello, Nathan. Hello. I'm very excited to have you join us. Um, You are actually our first graphic novel writer, so that's very exciting. (laughs) And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Some Assembly Required, what is it? So Some Assembly Required is actually a story about uh, friendship uh, that kind of turns to romance. It's a story about polyamory. It's a story about mental illness. Um, So it's basically the story of Louis, who is the main character of the story. And he's in love with his best friend, Laurent. Um, And, uh, sorry. Uh, And he, um, yeah, so basically Laurent sort of starts developing symptoms of mental illness. And Louis, by... uh, like, through his friendship and falling in love, sorry, my dogs are all over the place. Through his friendship <laughs> and falling in love with him, sort of um, helps him not get better because that's one of the tropes I hate. I hate most about like mental illness and romance is like let me kiss you and your mental illness goes away. But no, it, it's not that. It's like he learns to how to live with it and how to like basically be who he is every day and then and and do the things that he needs to do to cope. Oh, yeah. Goodness knows that's a lot. Uh, (laughs) So what inspired you to start this project? So uh, I actually have dissociative identity disorder, which is what uh, Laurent has in the story. And when I was dealing with the worst patches of of coping with my illness and everything, um, I started searching for works of fiction because I, I, I... I tend to view my life through the lens of fiction, and so I, you know... Uh, Can I ask you to backtrack for a moment, and just for listeners who might not know, give a quick explanation of what dissociative identity disorder is? So dissociative identity disorder is uh, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's actually a disorder in which you dissociate, uh, sort of like you you become used to dissociating so often that you actually have aspects of yourself that are like fragmented. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a dissociative disorder. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, dissociation and, and there's a weird relationship with your body too. Um, but yeah, basically I have these alters in my mind that are different aspects of my personality that sometimes take over and, you know, I would have like memory loss and, and, uh, people would have to deal with like what appeared to be really radical mood swings, but they, they weren't mood swings. They were just like personality changes. Um, so yeah, when I was dealing with the worst of it, uh, and my partner was helping me through it, you know, I didn't find anything that didn't picture us either as like people with dissoci- dissociative identity disorder as either like victims uh, or serial killers. For some reason, dissociative identity disorder is a really popular thing to give to your serial killer, even though it. Like, statistically speaking, you're far, far more likely to be a victim of violence than you are to be a perpetrator of violence if you have a mental illness. Um, So anyway, I got really fed up with people like me being represented like that. And I wanted to have something... I chose to do, like, the main character that didn't have the disorder as opposed to, like, the one that did because I didn't want to get into all the heaviness of, like, you know, psychotherapy and all that. I just wanted to like show the day-to-day life and how it affects the the others around you and how you cope um, with this. Awesome. I think that's really important, especially because as you said, um, dissociative identity disorder is so misrepresented. It's, Um, yeah, it's really discouraging what's out there. Yeah, it's something that I've actually personally been doing a fair bit of research on recently, and it's astounding to me how different the reality is from what is perceived to be the reality. Oh, yeah, it's completely ridiculous. Like, there's 
there's so many aw- aw- awful egregious things out there like i'm you know the movie split kind of comes to mind um that's kind of a most recent thing uh that was really i tried to put myself through this i don't know why i just i feel like i need to see all the things you know that represent uh the id and yeah I, don't do it it's awful um there was also like i can remember an episode of i used to like this show called psych it's about this like guy who cons people into thinking he's psychic and he solves crimes but he's really just observant so he doesn't really have any psychic ability anyway it's a comedy and there was this really awful episode that came on about this this guy who went around trying to get like what they call a sex change operation because he had like the id and one of his alters was a woman and whenever he met a therapist that wouldn't give him that he would murder them what seriously <laughs> seriously uh it was probably the most awful representation that i can think of that i've ever seen and i mean i've seen a lot a lot of it so yeah it was it was the the um, the worst both for like being transgender and for having did like it was just a combination of so many awful things it just boggles the mind yeah it really does boggle the mind that i i mean you know now at this point i've been doing this podcast for a while i've been i've interviewed a whole ton of authors in the past few weeks so now i'm very much immersed in these things (laughs) um but I, I don't think even before that it wouldn't like I would have been able to write that and not see at least some of the problems with that narrative. That's... Right. I mean, how do you do so little research that this seems like an OK thing to write? I don't know. Um, I think it does come from a lot of writers. Their research is just consuming other fiction. And sometimes that's okay but a lot of the time that leads to really problematic things especially when you're relying on fiction for research about marginalized folks absolutely absolutely and you know fiction about marginalized folks especially well not especially all fiction about marginalized folks is is mainly written by people who don't have that perspective and you know especially the big publishers tend to have like this this kind of idea of like, well, you know, Stephen King can write about it much better because he's Stephen King, right? Even though, like, and I'm not singling out Stephen King. I'm just, he's just the first name that pops to my mind when you think about a really big name author. Um, but, you know, I, any, like, cis het able-bodied, able mind white guy would be much better to write about these things because, you know, we can make them famous or he's already famous or, like, no, like, own voices is so important. And especially because, like you said, it feeds on itself, right? Like fiction engenders ideas and it creates more fiction and then you just perpetuate these ideas. Exactly. So bringing things back to some assembly required, you've been working on this project for a while now. And what has been the most exciting part of working on this project? Honestly, the reception that it's had, it's it's been really well received by by people who read it uh i have a lot of like avid fans that i know if i don't post my page on time and i've been really bad these past like couple of years about being on time (laughs) about posting my pages uh they let me know and and that's really i don't know it's it's kind of really cool to, to know that people are like oh my god i need one more page of this right now so yeah it's it's you know, because it's such a personal, personal thing for me to write this story. I've written a lot of weird fantasy and science fiction and, and all that. But this, this to me is, is probably like the most personal thing I've ever written. And to know that there are people out there who are just like, you know, hanging on every page is, is indescribable. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I'm glad to hear that it's doing so well. So you're also a co-owner of Renaissance Press. Can you tell us, let's start by telling us a little bit about what Renaissance Press is. 
So Renaissance Press is a publisher of diverse Canadian fiction. Um, we specialize in own voice fiction of all genre and all voices. So we, what we really do is we don't focus so much on like, oh, well, we publish mystery or we publish science fiction and fantasy. Is we focus on who's writing the story. So we want to see stories about disabled people written by disabled people. We want to see stories about, you know, LGBT people written by people who are of the same letter in the alphabet. So, you know, lesbian fiction by lesbian people, bisexual by bisexual people, transgender fiction by transgender people. We just want to see good, honest, own voice representation. Awesome. And how do you balance this having this publishing house with your personal creative projects? Honestly, um, it's not difficult to balance at all. Like I find I'm so excited by all the stuff that I publish that it feeds my own creativity. And then I, I have to go and write some more, you know, it's for sure. There's like expendent efforts and I have to count spoons like everybody, well, like everybody else, like a lot of other people. Um, but it's so inspiring doing that work with Renaissance, like working with all these awesome people and awesome stories that I don't know. It, it's like the kind of effort that, gives me more energy <laughs> absolutely i completely understand that how do you manage that with your disability does that impact the balance are there ways you've found to work around that to make it easier um i'd have to say like what impacts my disability most is probably my day job if i could make renaissance my day job that would probably not be a problem anymore because i'm, I'm quite good at pacing you know, like I, I, I tend to have a long view of like, okay, well, I need to get, you know, this book out by May. So that means that, you know, I'm very good at, at making piecemeal little goals. So like, okay, that means I have to do the cover by then. That means the editing has to do by then. And like, you know, little, little bits. And I never look at this whole big, like, okay, well, this book has to be done. I like, go, okay, this has to be done. This has to be done. This has to be done. I use Trello a lot and I use it with my team too. Um, it's an online tune tool. It's called, it's Trello.com. I think it is. And it's like, you can have little cards. And so every book has a little card and they have all the little steps listed and who's in charge of the little steps and when the little steps are due. So I kind of micromanage myself and it works really well for me. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that works for somebody. I actually use Trello for my day job. Yeah. And I find that it's really great for working with people. Uh, so my day job is I uh, edit a blog and so I work with freelancers and I find that it is really gr a great tool for working with people, uh, especially international folks. But I tried to create Trello boards for my own personal projects at one point, and it, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> I, I can't, that kind of micromanagement just makes me feel cramped and crowded and like I don't have any space. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, part of what I do is I, I also set myself, like I, I reserve certain days and certain spaces for doing nothing, which is something that I found I really need to do if I don't schedule like, you know, a family day, if I don't schedule, like, time for a meal, if I don't schedule things like this, I just don't do it. Um, I'm a workaholic, not in the sense that people go like, oh, well, a job interview, you know, I'm a workaholic, because I like to work hard. Like, no, I'm a workaholic in the sense that I, I used to go to the movies, and sit 15 minutes through the movie and go like really tense and not enjoy the movie at all, because I could be working. You know, I could be doing a project or something like that. Um, I couldn't have any hobbies. I couldn't enjoy anything. I would just work, 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 work myself like ragged because I needed to accomplish things and I needed to do things and I have all these projects going. And, and so I found that scheduling like that, like tomorrow is a day where I'm not working. It's Sunday. I'm spending time with my family. I have a brunch that I'm making. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to maybe play some Legos, but it's in my schedule. And it's like this, right? So if I don't, if I don't schedule time off, like I could very well go without meals or without taking a shower, just work, 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 work. So. I definitely understand that. I have definitely looked up from a, a book project or something else and we realized it's you know eight o'clock at night and I haven't eaten yet so yeah but how do you cope with the anxiety or does making it a scheduled thing 
mean that you don't have the anxiety when you're not working? Because it's creative. I find that really hard. Yeah, for me, having the scheduled thing and knowing like, okay, well, you know, this is the time for me to be doing this uh, takes away a lot of the anxiety. Because if I was just like going like not willy nilly, but going a little more like loosey goosey and, and going like, okay, well, right now I could do this right now. I could do that. Um, I would always have that anxiety of like, I should be working. I should be working on this project. I should be finishing this. This deadline is looming and all that. So for me, it's, it's scheduling is not like, I don't do it to myself. I do it for myself in the way that like, I, I need it to not have that anxiety. That's a really great reframing. I like that. Not doing it to <laughs> yourself, doing it for yourself. That's, yeah. you know, words are so important. And there are so many little things in the way that we as people with anxiety develop our internal self-talk. And so much of it is so toxic. It is. Like um, something that was said to me a few months ago that just totally reframed my whole mind was don't think that you're ugly think that you're not your type yes Uh, I heard that too and I love it (laughs) and as a a woman who is attracted to men who weigh like 90 pounds soaking wet um, I'm very much not my type (laughs) and that reframing has been so helpful for me It, it allows me to you know look in the mirror and not hate myself but it also makes it much easier to accept compliments and it's just it it seems like such a small change, but those tiny changes to how you think about yourself, how you talk to yourself can change your whole life. Oh yeah, definitely. So you are uh, very involved in the movement for representation of all folks. Can you talk a bit about where you see media in general, not just publishing, but media as a whole? is in terms of disability representation and what you would like to see change in representation in the coming years? Um, So there's a lot of the reason why I started Renaissance in, in this question. Um, There's just, there's just not that much great representation out there. And I got really tired of waiting for the big publishing houses to like, you know, kind of do it. And I think we're seeing more and more nowadays that it's just not going to happen. They're not going to like move out of their really rigid, like, Oh, well this, this needs to be like a certain like this so I can sell it, you know, so I can put it in a bookstore and sell it. Um, You know, there's, there's a lot of talk right now about the book American dirt. I don't know if you've obviously you're on author author Twitter. So you must've heard about it. I, I did an interview earlier today. We were actually just talking about this like less than an hour ago. Uh, but like, just in a case, perfect go-to example of how the industry just is not changing at all, and they're not they're not learning, they're not understanding this. Absolutely. Um, Can you give some context to that just for listeners? Yes. Yeah, so, so for listeners, familiar? American Dirt is a book that was written by, um, you know, by all all. Uh, reports a white woman with a a white immigrant boyfriend who's from Ireland I think yes or husband and she writes about the you know immigrant experience from um, a Mexican point of view using just reportedly because I haven't read the book and I don't intend to but um, horrible cliches and uh, yeah it's just it's just a garbage fire um the, everything around this book right now um but yeah it's it's to me it's it's just a perfect example and everything that's happening with romance writers of america too um you know like these big huge behemoths you know they're not they're not gonna change it's not it's not gonna happen it's what's going to change what's going to really change things is if people can start looking towards indie publishers like Renaissance, but like a lot of other publishers too. Um, you know, I'm, th- I'm thinking about HeartSpark Press uh, down in the States who does a lot of uh, transgender and then things f- specifically for transgender women and by transgender women. Um, and, and well, Renaissance, obviously I'm going to, Renaissance's biggest ambassador. So I'm always going to talk about uh, Renaissance books, but like people have to start questioning 
who writes the books that they're consuming? Whose perspective are do they have in their hands? Like, whose story is this? You know, a story about a black woman, is it going to be the same if it's written by a white man or by a black woman? Obviously, the answer to this should be obvious, but it's not. So, you know, look at where you're getting your books. Encourage indie publishers, encourage indie authors. Look up, like, recommendations by people who are actually from the demographic that you're interested in reading about. You know, like, listen to transgender people's recommendations of transgender book. Don't just go on the, like, New York Times and see what's selling because most of the time it's not going to be a good representation. Yeah, and I mean, just it being own voices doesn't necessarily mean that it's a really terrible representation. But if you're looking at a book about a marginalized person by a straight, cishet, white dude uh you need to look at the reviews of that book because you know unless you are from the marginalized identity that they're writing about there's a good chance you won't even notice the problems in the representation absolutely absolutely and goodreads is great for that because whenever there's a book that's um that's really good representation people talk about it like in our little circles you know like i'm i'm transgender and and looking at uh, you know, on Twitter and on Goodreads, I can always tell whether a book is going to have good representation by what other transgender people are talking about it. You know, if, if they're telling me like, oh, well, you know, there's that in it. Or if they're going like, oh my God, you should read this. Like, I know that I'm probably not going to have a bad experience reading this if another transgender person is putting it in my hands and going like, oh my God, it's so cool. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, are there any specific things that you see currently happening in media other than, you know, the appropriation of marginalized stories by non-marginalized folks that is, uh, that you would like to see die? (laughs) (laughs) Things like, you know, harmful tropes. What, what would you like to see less of? (laughs) Uh, I would really, really love to see a lot less of mental health being, used as uh, an excuse and a prop for people committing horrible, horrible things. Um, Mentally ill people are not your enemy. Mentally ill people are not a danger to you. And, um, you know, just because someone is talking to themselves on the bus doesn't mean that they're a bad person. Um, So, yeah, this is is the one thing I would like to see die. I haven't seen Joker, uh, but I've heard a lot of really bad things about it. Um, you know, it's just, it's so anchored in the brain of, in, in like the, the social sort of consciousness that, oh, like mentally ill people, they'll, they'll kill you. They'll do this. They'll do that. Like this, this is probably the one thing right now that is my, my battle. Like I need to see this die. Yeah. And it's, it's so common right now, right now. Like the thing that is in vogue is for, villains to have tragic backstories and mental illnesses and i don't necessarily think that's an a bad thing but it's not when it's not balanced by the heroes also having mental illnesses and you know doing exactly. heroic stuff it it's extremely harmful and you know what here's the thing most people when they experience something horrible and tragic will actually develop a lot more empathy and a lot less likeliness of of becoming a hardened criminal or or something like that you know it's not something that you learn necessarily because of trauma and trauma actually makes you a lot more empathetic to other people's trauma it doesn't make you a killer generally not um (laughs) And yet, I mean, it's maybe your trauma is being groomed to be a serial killer, and then you became a serial killer because, you know, you were kind of trained that way, but for the most part. Yeah, but it's not because, you know, like, it's, it is definitely something I need to see die. <laughs> Absolutely. I am, I am with you there. I, I do find it hard to talk about that particular trope because all, all of my villains do have mental illnesses, but, like, you can point at any character in my book except for literally the dragon and it will have a mental illness. Uh, <laughs> that's just... Why doesn't the dragon have a... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
he just he he's very innocent and naive. He he hasn't been exposed to anything uh, to give him a mental illness at the time <laughs> of the story. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I point at any of the humans in my books, and you can pretty much guarantee they have a mental illness unless they are only visible in like one scene, one time. Um, so I do have some trouble talking about this subject, but I. I think there's a very specific way that it's happening in the media right now. And honestly, I think it's all because of the Dark Knight. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because the Dark Knight popularized that portrayal of the villain. And that that whole trilogy really popularized that kind of portrayal of villains so much. And all of the... you You can look back at so many, so many things and look like, okay, well, you know, like... Uh, people killing people because they're hearing voices telling them to do so, you know, like, um, and I think about examples from my own youth. Like I, I remember uh, primal fear. I remember like, uh, um, oh my God, fight club. I remember, you know, things like it's always been a trope. It's always been a trope. Uh, even looking at things like silence of the lambs, you know, like oh, you, absolutely. It, it's you, repopularized every couple of decades by a yeah. new piece of media this couple of decades i i think it was the dark knight absolutely especially because so many of the movies coming out now are comic book movies and like what really put comic book movies on the map again was that batman trilogy yeah i feel like a lot of the the comic book movies are overly angsty now because they're trying to lean into that kind of success and it doesn't work for a lot of comic book characters but that's a whole different podcast (laughs) yeah this is also another thing like you know dealing with these things doesn't always need to be like gritty and and scary and dark and and everything like it could just be like ordinary because mental illness is really prevalent a lot of people have mental illness um it is something that's quite ordinary actually and the people that have severe mental illness that you would never know about by just interacting with them five minutes you know this is what i want to see represented i want to see people just living their lives absolutely and can you give a shout out to some works of media that are doing disability representation well i mean obviously you've got all of renaissance press but i would love to see you uh, share the love a little bit to other creators as well um, well, I have I have to recommend Nothing Without Us um, by it edited by Kat Gordon and Talia Johnson. I know that it's a Renaissance book, but it's just it's just such a stupendous work. Um, I've I've published it for sure, and I have a story in it. But I've read it and reread it and reread it because it's it's so comforting. It's so there's some stories that will make you feel vindicated. There's some stories that'll make you go like, "Oh my god, that's so cool!" And there's some stories that'll make you laugh out loud. This is definitely the kind of representation that I want to see a, a lot more of in the media. Um, as for like positive representation of mental illness, I really like Amelie. Um, I know that it's probably not the first thing that pops into people's mind when you go like, oh, mental illness, but it is definitely about like, you know, mental health and mental illness and and, then people's relationship with trauma and relationship with each other. Um, Yeah, I can't think of a lot of really nice positive representations off the top of my head because so much of what I see is so bad, but uh, those two. (laughs) Awesome. Two is plenty, unfortunately. Um, And hopefully by the time you finish, by the time this actually goes live, you will have listened to all the other episodes of the podcast and you will have way more disabled stories to talk about. That would be awesome. So we are getting close to time. Can you tell people where to find out more about you and your work and especially where they can find out more about Renaissance Press. So I will give you a couple of things to look at. You can always go on my website, uh, nathancarofrichette.ca. Uh, you can find out about my stories there. Uh, there's also on tapas.io, you can look up Some Assembly Required by Nathan Frichette. Uh, I, I recommend it. <laughs> to find out more about Renaissance Press, you can go to Presse Renaissance Press, which is P-R-E-S-S-E-S renaissancepress.ca um, we are closed for submissions right now but if you have something 
awesome that you think we'll really, really love that's own voices, you can always send us an email and inquire. Um, all of our books are listed there, uh, and you can find out about all the awesome people that makes up Renaissance. We're like, I don't know, I think there are about 30 people now. All oh, wow. All. Yeah, it's, it's grown quite a bit. I think we're publishing our 40th book this year. Congratulations. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> It's growing leaps and bounds. You can really, when I started Renaissance, I didn't expect how much response I would get. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really, you can see the need for own voices fiction out there just by how how much we're growing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my first interview was with Kat Gordon, who runs the Spoonie Authors Network. And that was something she said, too. You know, there, she expected to be working on it with, you know, her and maybe one or two of her friends. And now they have 20 contributors and, you know, I put out one tweet for this podcast and got all of the interviews I needed for three months immediately <laughs> uh, had people sign up for. There's definitely a need and uh, I'm really excited to see that people are out there and they're telling the stories, even if they have to, at this point, still be telling the stories through small presses and self-publishing and we're not getting the eyes of the mainstream media but we're out here writing stories and it's really great mm -hmm. i got another recommendation that really popped in my mind right now check out uh, soul's blood by stephen graham king it is a fantastic sort of like you know bad boy sci-fi <laughs> uh it's it, it if you like um What's it called? Oh my god, I have such a bad memory for things. Firefly. If you like Firefly, you will love this, and it's super queer, and it has disability representation and non-binary representation, and it's awesome. Awesome. I'm very excited to check that one out. Uh, Soul's Blood is such a great title, too. Jeez. It is cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it has been really lovely to chat with you. Um, such a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us and for being your awesome, authentic self. And have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Spoonie Authors Podcast. The Spoonie Authors Podcast is part of the Spoonie Authors Network, a community initiative devoted to sharing the stories of disabled authors and educating abled people about what life is like for disabled creatives. Transcripts of this podcast are also available on the Spoonie Authors Network. To learn more or become a contributor, visit SpoonieAuthorsNetwork.blog. And of course, if you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to leave a five-star review on your favorite podcast streaming platform.